Well, there was one announcement that I forgot to make with everyone who is visiting for the first time. And if you didn't when you visited the first time, we want to make sure that you get a Bible. We have MacArthur Study Bibles on the front desk. There's two different versions, the ESV and the, the New American Standard. Please grab one. You're more than welcome to it. That's what we have them for. So if you're a first-time visitor, please grab a Bible. Um, so I want you to know that. We are privileged to have Michael State and Marcy and Michael are in town. Drove down last night from um, outside of Oklahoma City in Mustang. Michael is the pastor of First Baptist Mustang in Mustang, Oklahoma. And we are just so excited that he, many of you know him. Uh, Michael and Marcy have been here multiple times before. We're so glad that they're back in town. Michael, will you come read the scriptures and pray for us? Good morning. So good to be with you again, as it always is. If you've got your Bible, I invite you to open with me to John chapter 1. It's not an exaggeration to say that this passage that we look at this morning may be as meaningful and precious as any we could possibly study together this morning. John chapter 1 verses 14 to 18 it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Would you pray with me? Our Father and our God, we steady our hearts this morning and just pause to be still and be reminded that you are God. Lord, we understand that Sunday mornings can be hectic and even chaotic. Even this morning there has been such a, a great sound of the people in this church talking and conversing. We rejoice in that and yet we want to remind ourselves that the most important thing that we could hear today is your word being shared through the power of your spirit to each individual heart. We do not want to miss anything you have for us. And so, Lord, for those this morning who are physically tired, I pray that you would give them energy to actively listen. For those this morning who are here whose minds and hearts are distracted because of a burden that they are carrying, I pray that your Spirit would comfort them. For those who are here today, Lord, who find themselves spiritually dry and just struggling, I pray that today you would deepen and strengthen their faith. Lord, for those who may be brand new to the church and brand new to this, this sweet fellowship today, Lord, I pray they would feel at home and know that they are welcomed here and wanted here. And Lord, for those among us who do not know you in a personal way, who have not come to faith through the work of your Son, Jesus, I pray that even this morning, your Spirit would open their eyes, draw them unto yourself, that this could be the very day that salvation would come into someone's life today who would be here that desperately needs to know what it is to find the grace of Jesus Christ. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Well, what a blessing 
to be with you. It, it always is. We've had a chance to, to be down here these last, this last year and a half, every couple of months, and it really is a joy and delight for us to be able to be here. Uh, for those of you who have been here for a while, it's, it's great to see you again and be able to visit with many of you. And uh, my heart's been encouraged already today to get to meet some of you who are brand new to the church. And uh, it's always exciting to see new people, new families the Lord is bringing to uh, this church. And we are grateful for our, our friendship together with you. Uh, this has been uh, just a really uh, exciting season uh, in our life. Uh, as I shared, we were here in, in August. Uh, at that time, we were just preparing for our youngest son to move out. Uh, my oldest is at Oklahoma University, and my youngest just moved out to Oklahoma State uh, University, so we've got one at both schools. And so Marcy and I, for the first time in our life, uh, are empty nesters. And so we are in the early days of figuring that out, uh, but so far, so good. I think, for me, so good. Um, I think she's, she's doing all right. Um, we are thrilled of this, of this season of life the Lord has, has brought us to and just His faithfulness and His goodness to us. Um, I, I appreciate uh, the, the prayers for our church in, in Mustang, Oklahoma. Uh, I am just about to finish uh, in just a couple of weeks my 19th year uh, serving at, at that church, and uh, we feel so blessed to be there. This has been a, a great week for us. Um, we had, on Sundays, I usually preach uh, three times on Sundays, and uh, I also have a, a men's theology class I teach on Sunday afternoons, and so Sundays for me typically uh, are about four different hours of teaching. Uh, and then this week on Monday night, uh, I do every couple of months a ladies night of theology. Uh, just ladies show up, do two hours of just systematic theology with our ladies, and uh, we had about 150 ladies or so show up Monday night. Uh, then Tuesday morning, I'm back at the church by 6.30 teaching my men's theology class again. And then this coming Wednesday, uh, my wife and I leave, uh, with, I'm leading a group of 50 from our church to Israel. Uh, so we're getting ready to, to, to fly uh, to Israel on Wednesday. And so this is just a really exciting uh, month of ministry for us. And uh, I am thrilled that in the Lord's providence, He's allowed us to be able to be here on this day with you, uh, part of what has been uh, just a fun thing for us this month to look forward to and anticipate uh, with all the great things the Lord allows us to be a part of is to be here with you, uh, and this truly is an honor for me today, as it always is, to be here with you to, to share God's Word. Um, something you may not know about me, my, my, my friends and church family back home certainly knows this, but something you may not know about me uh, is I am probably... Uh, the world's uh, foremost fan of the Christmas season. Um, October 1st for me is a national holiday because October 1st is when you can finally say Christmas is month after next. Um, so I'm one of those guys. So um, I understand uh, some of you may not be a big fan of, of all the early Christmas things, but for me it just, it just can't get here early enough. And of all things, I've been assigned this text of John 1.14, the Word became flesh. Uh, so, in my, in my office, I've been listening to Christmas music now for 20 straight days. October 1st <laughs> is when we switch over to Christmas music in, in my office. Um, and so, John 1.14 could not be a more perfect and, and fitting uh, text for me to be assigned in all seriousness, part of why we as Christians love the Christmas season is because it's a reminder of this event that is so amazing, that is so life-changing, there is just nothing more spectacular than the truth that God became flesh and dwelt among us. And, and there's just something about that truth that I, I just hope and pray as believers never becomes old news to us. That in a few weeks as Christmas season starts in, in real, uh, in, in our lives, as you start to see lights and trees and decorations and Christmas music, I, I pray that all of that could be used to remind you of what it is all about. We certainly live in a, in a culture, in a world that loves to celebrate the season, but the season without understanding its 
basis is of no value. But if you understand what the celebration of the birth of Christ is all about, it should be something that you just never recover from that truth. It's not an exaggeration to say that John 1.14 is the sentence that changes everything. It is a truth that is far beyond words. It could not be talked about enough. It could not have enough songs written to describe it. There should be something in the heart of the believer that when we come to the truth of John 1.14, we just stop every time as though we're hearing it for the first time because it's that breathtaking. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's an amazing truth of the amazing grace of Jesus Christ. So let's, let's walk this morning here in John 1, in verses 14 to 18. And we'll do it with four headings. If you want to write down some notes to help you to kind of follow the train of thought, we'll do it with four headings. First, let's look at the humanity of Christ. The humanity of Christ. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word became flesh. This is what we know as the doctrine of the incarnation. Uh, The word that's used here, that's translated in English as flesh, is a word that it can be used different ways depending on the context. Uh, The same word can be used to refer to the the negative moral part of humanity, as in deeds done in the flesh. That's how the Apostle Paul often uses it. In this context, flesh, though, is, is just referring to humanity, that Christ left heaven and was found in the flesh. It's not that He merely appeared to be human, it's that He took on humanity. Now, there was an old heresy, the, the Docetus, that, that put this out there, that, that Christ just seemed to be human. Uh, the, that, that whole idea comes from a, an, an ancient word that means to seem, and so what they would say is Christ just seemed to be in human form, that He was really just a a phantom. That's not what the Word teaches us. The Word became flesh. Now this is important because there are a number of things that Christ does for us that requires that He would take on flesh. He is going to die in our place, die as our perfect substitute. He is going to be our propitiation, meaning He is going to satisfy the wrath of God. And so He dies as our perfect substitute. That requires that He would be a man. He's going to sympathize with us. The Bible says that in Christ we have a high priest who is able to sympathize as He was tempted and tried just as we were yet without sin. And He's going to show us how to live. He's going to leave for us an example to follow. And so this is not Christ just appearing to be a man or seeming to be a man. This is the Word becoming flesh. This is what we sing about at Christmas time. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity, pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. Word means God with us. Hark the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king. We're singing about the incarnation of Christ. This shocking statement that the word became flesh. And this statement, while it may seem common to us because we've heard this all of our life, understand to the ancient Greek reader, this would have been completely bizarre to them. The the ancient mind that that held that the physical world was evil and and only the spiritual world could be good, that for them the body was this 
prison house to which the soul was confined. It would have been a completely cursed thing for the great mind to think about God taking on flesh. This is a statement that John makes that is as bold as it is unimaginable to his first readers. That the eternal God is taking on flesh. That God is choosing to draw near to His creation, to be with us in a more personal way than ever before. The Word became flesh. And it says, He dwelt among us. This phrase uses a verb form of the Greek word for tabernacle. And so what he says here is that the Word became flesh, and as was prayed earlier, tabernacled among us, or He lived in a tent is what the, the word would, would mean. It's a very rarely used word in your New Testament. In fact, the word is used only here and in the book of Revelation. John is literally saying that the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us that we were able to see Him. They were able to watch how Jesus lived. They could see how He treated people. They could see how He treated His friends. They could see how He treated those who persecuted Him. They could watch and, and see everything that He did. And by using this word dwelt or tabernacle, no doubt John is calling our minds back to the Old Testament, to the tabernacle that was such a big part of Israel's desert wanderings. Jesus is taking on flesh and He tabernacled among us. What, 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 what does that call to our mind? Well, think about the tabernacle in the Old Testament. It was the center for their worship. 45 feet long, it's 15 feet wide, had three main areas, had the outer courtyard where the, the priest would make sacrifices, had the outer room where you had the table of showbread and the candlestick, it had uh, the inner room where you had the Ark of the Covenant. This is the place where the people would gather for worship. This was the place of revelation, this was the place of sacrifice. And this is what John says Jesus is bringing in the flesh to His people. As the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. John says that Christ now embodies all of these things in the flesh as God draws near. That is the humanity of Christ. But I want you to see, secondly, the revelation of Christ. There are some things that Christ reveals, some things that He makes known as we watch His life. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen, here are the things He reveals, the things He makes known, we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So Christ comes and He reveals to us glory. He says that we have seen His glory. And, and the, the wording here is interesting because John uses a word here translated for to see that is a word that doesn't just simply mean to, to, to notice. It's a word that means to look intently. It means to, to study it, to, to perceive it, to understand. And what we are understanding as we look at Christ is that we see His glory. Colossians 2.9 says that in Christ the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And so this gives us, if we see this, a really helpful definition and explanation of what it means to be a Christian. To be a Christian is to look at Jesus and see the glory of God. Where other people look at Jesus and look at His life and, and hear His teachings and, and consider who He is. And other people may say, well, He was, he was just a, a teacher. Or He was this 
this miracle worker, or he was this evangelist, or he was just a prophet, or he was just someone who was a victim and someone who was a martyr. What the believer looks at Christ and sees is not just that he's a teacher, and not that he's a prophet, not that he's a victim. They look at Jesus and say, that is the revealed glory of God. In other words, what you see when you see Christ can reveal to you whether or not you are a part of the family of God. When you see Christ, what a believer sees, looks at intently, perceives and understands, is they are looking at the very glory of God. And this is a very helpful thing for us to think about. In fact, let me read you the words of, of one author who said it this way. That where people needed help, Jesus helped them. Where they were sick, He healed them. Where there were people who were ignorant, He taught them. And where there were hungry people, He fed them. All the time, Jesus was seeking the needy. All of His life, He was among God's little people. Those who in one way or another felt their need. And wherever there was need, He was found doing lowly service. And that is what Christ came to do. And in that is glory, which tells us that the glory revealed in Christ is the glory of the suffering servant. It's remarkable to think about. That when Christ reveals the glory of God, He does so by revealing God's heart to seek and to save that which was lost. To say that that God is going to take on flesh and dwell among us, if God is not a God of grace, would be the most frightening story imaginable to be told. God drawing near, if He is not a God of mercy, would be a story of people simply being consumed in judgment. But it's the very words of the song that we sang together a few moments ago, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Why can we sing that? Because Christ reveals the glory of God, but does so in such a way that shows us that He Himself is the suffering servant prophesied in the Old Testament, the one sent from the Father to seek and to save the lost. So for any who may be among us this morning, if you are not a believer, if you are not a Christian, if you have not been saved by grace through faith, I need to be honest and tell you that while it's true God's wrath resides upon you in your sinful state, I want to also make sure you understand that the glory of God is a glory revealed in this truth, that He sent His Son to seek and save the lost. That this very morning, if you would turn from your sin, repent of your sin, and trust in Christ alone, the Bible says if you believe that He is the Son of God, that He died and was raised from the dead, you shall be saved. Why? Because it is the glory of God revealed in Christ that Christ, the suffering servant, came to seek and to save the lost. This morning, if you do not know Christ as your Savior, salvation can come to your heart today. Cry out to the Lord and ask Him to forgive you. Ask Him to bless you with spiritual eyes to see who Jesus is so that when you look at Jesus, you don't just think of a teacher or a prophet or a man who did miracles, but you look at Christ as the very Son of God, the Savior for any who would call upon His name. This is the revelation of who Christ is, that He Himself shows us the glory of God displayed in His sacrifice and in His grace. That's the second thing He reveals to us. Not only glory, He reveals to us grace, and He reveals to us, thirdly, truth. And grace and truth go together. You have to know the truth because no one is saved apart from the truth, but there must be grace because no one is going to be saved based on their own merit. We need grace 
and truth. John 8, 24, unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. So we must have the truth of who Christ is, but only by grace can your sins be forgiven. This takes us, I think, purposefully back again to the Old Testament that John wants us to have in our mind here with the word tabernacle. He tabernacled among us, and the tabernacle was the place where sacrifices for sin would be made. In the Old Testament, the tabernacle, the, the sacrifices that would be offered would be the blood of a bull or the blood of a goat. And all those sacrifices in the Old Testament, the Bible says, those were just shadows pointing us toward the one true once-for-all sacrifice, which will be Christ Himself laying down His life as a sacrifice for our sin. In fact, we see a perfect mingling of grace and glory at the cross. The whole event of Jesus on the cross for us is this perfect commingling of grace and glory. In fact, it'll be a little while before we get to it in John 12, but in a few months down the road, John 12, 23, we'll be studying these words that the hour has come for the Son of Man to be what? Glorified. The hour is coming when the Son of Man will be glorified. That Christ is going to come and lay down His life and He's going to be crucified and buried. But praise the Lord, He's going to be raised back to life on the third day. And all of that is working together for glory. It is in the act of His grace of laying down His life that we see grace and glory perfectly coming together. Which is why... The Bible says in Galatians 6, God forbid that we should boast except in one thing, the cross of Jesus Christ our Lord. That's it. But we don't boast in our works because our works apart from the Spirit is nothing but filthy rags. We don't boast in our wealth because the Bible says in Deuteronomy that it is the Lord who gives His people the strength to even do work to acquire wealth. We don't boast in anything because James 1 tells us that every good gift we have has come down from the hands of the Father. So the only thing we boast in is the cross of Jesus Christ where we see glory and grace joined together where justice and peace the Old Testament says meet and kiss each other and what we see is this salvation made available for us because of grace and because of truth and we have received his grace in fact jump ahead to verse 16 for from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace this is what it is to be a believer, to receive grace upon grace, grace after grace after grace after grace. Grace is something that is undeserved, and the word also means something that is charming. That's true for what grace is for us. It's what we receive that we did not deserve, and it's something that is a beautiful thing. John says that in Christ, in His sacrifice, we receive grace Day after day after day. Now listen to me, friends. This is critically important. The idea here is that in Christ we receive grace after grace after grace after grace. Grace for the days of health to be able to enjoy them and grace in the days of sickness in order to remain faithful. Grace to be able to handle the energy of youth and grace to be able to handle the, the struggle of old age, grace to be able to handle material blessings when they come our way, and grace to be able to handle days of, of struggle and need, grace to be able to handle seasons spiritually of obvious blessing, and days of grace to be able to handle when persecution comes our way. In Christ, we have received grace upon grace, over and over again, every need for every day. In fact, listen to the words of Martin Luther writing here about grace. He says, The fountain is inexhaustible 
It is full of grace and truth before God. It never fails, no matter how much we draw from it. It remains a perennial fount of all grace and truth, an unfathomable well, an eternal fountain. Here, listen to this sentence as it ends. The more we draw from it, the more it gives. So rightly did we sing today, Amazing Grace. It's amazing. The more grace you receive, the more grace that there is. The more you draw from the fountain of His grace, the more grace the fountain gives. We in Christ receive grace upon grace upon grace. It's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. The law is given that shows us our sin, grace is given to save us from our sin. In fact, I was just reading this week in a book that described this. Um, now, let me, before I, let me just make a confession here. I'm, I'm not a baseball fan. Um, in, in fact, th- this, is, this is literally true. I have not watched one at-bat in the Major League Baseball season until last night. In the hotel room, flipping the channels for some reason. Uh, here, here is the Yankee Astro game, and I thought I, I'll watch one at bat. And so I've not seen one pitch the entire season, and I watched the walk-off home run uh, of the guy in the white jerseys that beat the team in the gray jerseys, and uh, that's about all I know about baseball. I make that confession so that when I tell you what I'm about to tell you, I don't want to mislead you and you think that I'm like some giant baseball fan, but if you are, this may actually connect with you. 1988, Chicago Cubs did something pretty interesting. They traded for a guy named Vance Law, who was a third baseman. They brought up from the minor leagues a guy named Mark Grace, who was a first baseman. And so for two seasons, the infield of the Chicago Cubs was anchored by Law and Grace. (laughs) Somebody would hit it to the third baseline. Law would scoop it up, and he would take that ball and hurl it over to Grace. And so for two seasons, what you saw was the the diamond, the the first and third base corners, anchored by Law and Grace, keeping everything in between together. In a similar way in the Christian life, our sin, we are scooped up by Law, but praise the Lord, what the Law does is hurl us over to Grace. Grace. The law doesn't save us. Grace is what brings salvation into our life. The law reveals our need. It reveals our sin. It reveals our weakness. And if that was all that it did, we would be left completely without hope. But that's not what it did. The law hurls us to grace, throws us to Christ. If we would see Christ for who He is, if we would understand what grace is all about, it's what brings us together. The law that convicts us of our sin and teaches us to fear, and what does the song say? And grace our fears relieved. And so in Christ, we see the revelation of the glory and of grace and the revelation of truth. You studied here as a congregation a few months ago in Ephesians 2. By grace you are saved, not of works, lest anyone would boast. Everything about your salvation is all about grace. It is grace that purchased our salvation. It is grace that opens our eyes to see our need of salvation. It is grace that gives us the gift of faith. It is grace that draws us into salvation. It is grace that sustains us and sanctifies us. It is grace that one day will call us home. Everything about our salvation is all about grace. Amen? It's all about grace. This is one of the great things about studying verse by verse through a gospel is you're just confronted with Christ week after week after week after week. You can't get away from Christ, which calls us 
every single Sunday to this truth. Do we see Christ? And when we see Christ, what do we see? Well, you pray for eyes to see that in Christ you see the glory of God and grace and truth, because that is what it means to be a Christian. And to say that he was full of grace and also, at the end of verse 14, he's full of truth, even that takes us back to the tabernacle of the Old Testament that John wants to be in our mind. This is the place where the Ten Commandments are kept, and now Christ himself is the very embodiment of truth. When Christ ascends to heaven after his resurrection, he says, I'm going to send the spirit of truth. Everything about Christ is about truth. John 8, 32, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. See, salvation demands grace and truth go together. You have to know the truth and you have to receive grace. And if you see those two things together, what you will understand is the glory of who God is. Which is why John says, when you see Christ, you see the one who is full of glory and grace and truth. I can't think of this without my mind going to the end of Christ's earthly life when he appears before Pilate. And Pilate is this man who is... um, kind of superstitious, he's at the end of his rope, he doesn't know what to do with Christ, he's torn between trying to not lose his standing uh, with Rome, not trying to have the local people revolt, and now they are screaming and chanting for Christ to be crucified, though Pilate himself says, I've looked at him, I've examined him, I don't see that he's done anything wrong, and because he will not stand for truth, he tries to save his own skin, Rather than standing for the truth, he finds himself being disgruntled and disillusioned, and he finally has Jesus right before him, eyeball to eyeball, and he looks at Jesus and says, what is truth? What a great question. For Pilate, it was the words of a, of a sarcastic man trying to save his own political career, But the question he asks is worthy of your consideration this morning. What is truth? Well, the Bible tells us Jesus is the revelation of all truth. He is the one full of glory, full of grace, and full of truth. We see the humanity of Christ. We see the revelation of Christ. Let me show you thirdly, the superiority of Christ. The superiority of Christ. Look with me at verse 15. John the disciple will write now about a man known as John the Baptist and two different men. He says, John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. This is a bit of a, of a strange sentence, if you don't understand what, what he's referring to here. It says, John bore witness about him, which lets us know, bore witness here, it, it brings to our mind the imagery of a courtroom, a witness that's been brought up to tell the truth. And it says that John the Baptist cried out. In other words, this was his public testimony. Can I just remind you, friends, that the life of a Christian is the life of a public testimony with Christ. That increasingly in our day where it becomes more and more costly to publicly identify with Christ Those who are truly His people need to be reminded that we are to publicly testify of Christ. That this is not just some little thing we add to our life, this is a new life. That this isn't just something we do because it's good for business or popularity. This is something that we do because we've been completely transformed and changed from the inside out. And John the Baptist cries out publicly, as you and I should, that Christ 
is greater than all, that Christ is superior to all things and to all people. And here's what John the Baptist cried out. Speaking of Jesus, he says, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. Now, John the Baptist was a pretty impressive man himself. I mean, an angel announces his birth, and he's known as a man of courage and a man of strength, and yet he insists, rightly so, that Jesus is above him because Christ is, he says, before him. Now, if you're familiar with the Old Testament or the New Testament, you know that John the Baptist is six months older than Jesus. John the Baptist starts his public ministry before Jesus. And yet he says, Jesus is before me. And there are two things that are true here. One, is this shows us and reminds us that Christ is before John the Baptist because Christ is God. That while He takes on flesh at a point in time, He's not a created being. He is the eternal God. He does exist before John the Baptist. And He does exist before Abraham. He's the eternal God Himself. But He also is before John because He is superior to John. He is greater than John. He is above John. John the Baptist, great as he is, he's not a perfect man. He himself goes through some struggles and doubts. But as great as John the Baptist is, his life will end like all other great men and like all other great leaders. His life ends in death, whereas... Christ's life does not end in death. He is raised back to life. Rightly, does John the Baptist say, He is before me because Christ is eternal and because Christ is superior. He is greater than all. And then fourth and final, let me show you the uniqueness of Christ. The uniqueness of Christ. We've looked at verse 17, the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law scoops us up, so to speak, hurls us to the good news of grace. And here in verse 18, the uniqueness of Christ, no one has ever seen God, the only God, he who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Verse 18 forms what we would call an inclusio with verse 1, an inclusio is is a technique in, in writing where you would you'd use similar wording that becomes a bracket, that becomes bookends to hold everything in the middle together. And when you read verse 1 and you read verse 18, you see this inclusio. This is what we know as the prologue here of John's Gospel. And he's emphasizing here in verse 18 the shared nature of the Son and the Father. That it is Christ who makes... God known for us. In fact, keep John 1 marked, um, and it's going to be a few months before you get here, so let me just remind you of what you're going to get to in John 14. Turn over to your right just a few pages to John 14. Such a wonderful, wonderful passage of Scripture here. John 14, verse 1, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. By the way, incidentally here, sermon within a sermon, the the great thing about heaven, the greatest thing about heaven is that you are with Christ. That's what makes heaven, heaven. One of the ways to test yourself to know, do I really love Christ, is this. If you could have everything you've ever wanted in heaven, but you have no Christ, would you still want to be there? 
The world would. The believer would not. Because the believer understands the greatest gift Christ can give is the gift of himself. He says the good news is that where I am is where you will be. Verse 4, and you know the way to where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? Back to John 1.18. This is the uniqueness of who Christ is. And he says, it's a very, very interesting phrase here. He has made Him known. He has made him known. A couple of different words that that John could have used here. He does not use the more common term here, to make known. He uses a much more rare expression. In fact, the, the, the term in the Gospel of John is only found here. He uses a term, you can... You can hear it in in the Greek word. You'll be able to hear the English word in it. Exegeomai. We get our English word for exegesis. To exegete something, we talk about it in preaching. To exegete a passage is to make clear what is in the text. When you do exegesis as as a... Bible teacher, what you're doing is you are understanding the text, interpreting the text, explaining the text, making clear what is in the passage, that you're not doing what we would call eisegesis, where you're trying to read things into it, but you take what is there and you bring the truth out of it. You explain out of the text what's here. You make it clear. You make it known. That's the word John uses. It's a much more rare term. Christ has made God known. It means He has fully explained to us. He has made clear to us. He interprets for us. You could say that He is exegeting who God is. That Christ in the flesh is literally a living, breathing, walking sermon of truth. So, so that you can know God. It's an amazing thing. The same word is also translated and, and used to describe, to, to narrate. Um, it can be used to describe someone who is taking an event and, and helping to tell the story. In fact, I'll just show it to you. Just turn to your left uh, one, one page uh, in Luke 24. After the resurrection, while Jesus is walking here with, the, with the, the followers on the road to Emmaus, verse 35, Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was making known, how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. They are telling what happened. They're narrating. They're, they're telling the full story of what has taken place. You could say that Jesus not only is exegeting the, the truth of who God is, you can also say that here Christ is telling the full story. He is narrating to us the whole story of who God is. How can you know God by knowing Christ? How can you know the truth of who God is? by knowing the truth of what Christ said. When you look at Christ, you are looking at the one in whom the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily. So the question for you and for me today is what do you see when you see Christ? That literally affects your eternal 
destiny. What do you see when you see Christ? In these five verses, what we have seen this morning is the gospel. That God came near to us in the form of His Son, who shows us about glory, specifically His glory in being the suffering servant, who Himself is the embodiment of grace and truth, that through Him we can know the eternal God, and in so doing, by grace, we receive everlasting life. That is amazing grace. So let's just end where we begin. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So my question to you, which group are you in? This morning, there are two groups of people. One are believers, still sinners, imperfect, but their sin is covered. Why? Because in Christ, they see Him for who He is. The one who laid down His life, that offers grace, that if you would believe the truth of the gospel, you can be saved. The other group would look at Jesus and simply see anything less than that. See, this morning, you may be one who would say, you know what, I, I have a very high esteem for Jesus. I, I, I think he was a great man. I think he was a great teacher. I, I love to read his writings and his sermon, and I love to read what's written about him. And I don't really know him. I don't really believe he's the Son of God, but I think he's a great man. I, I, think, he's, I think he's a good teacher, if that's all you see. If you see anything less than the very Son of God who is the Savior of the world, then this morning I invite you to look again. And I pray for you that the Spirit of God would give you today the eyes to see who He truly is. He is the one, the only way, truth, and life. And He is the only road for salvation. There is no other place to travel. There is no other path to take that ends in heaven. The only way to the Father is through the Son, Jesus Christ. And what you see when you see Christ is the single most important thing about you. If you are a believer today and you understand the glory and the grace and the truth of Jesus, the only response you should have is that of humble worship because you did not figure that out yourself. That was given to you as a gift from the Holy Spirit. And humble worship should be our only response. And if this morning you do not see who Christ is, would you even today, in your heart, cry out to the Lord and ask Him to give you eyes to see who Christ is and to give you faith to believe in who Christ is that you too could be saved by the grace of God in truth, of the glorious gospel of Jesus. And may this church publicly cry out that Jesus is the way and the truth 
and the life. That all who hear and all who enter would be clear on this. There is no other Savior. Salvation is found in the name of Christ and only in the name of Christ. And one day, one day everyone will see Him for who He is. And one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But it makes all the difference in the world for your eternity if you see that today. There is no other way. But there is no one and nothing else needed. It is Christ and it is Christ alone who took on flesh and dwelt among us. And for those with the eyes of faith, what they saw then and what we see today is the one full of glory and grace and truth. What an amazing truth to believe. Lord, we just pause in reverent worship as we've been reminded of who your Son, Jesus Christ, is. Not a mere teacher, not a mere prophet, but the very Son of God, the Eternal One, Everything the Bible says that is coming to being is coming to being by Him, through Him, for Him, held together by Him. And one day, every knee bows, every tongue confesses this truth that today we, the church, the body of Christ, we proclaim the great truth that Jesus Christ is Lord. May we publicly declare that with grace and gentleness. May we preach that, and may we never recover from the truth that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And may we, when we see Christ, see Him for who He is, the one full of glory, full of grace, and full of truth. It is for His name and for His glory we pray. Amen.